Comparing CPUs and GPUs of utterly different architecture can be a daunting task. Now, this was the case for the last generation, but luckily this is not the case for the new generation of consoles. In this episode, we'll be taking an in-depth look at the CPUs, GPUs, and RAM of the PS4 and Xbox One. It's LP from Techno Buffalo welcoming you back to the next installment of the Console Wars. If I were to have made this comparison back in the good old days, the round would have lasted probably two minutes. But now, 25 years later, things have gotten a bit more complex. So I'm just going to cut to the chase. Both Sony and Microsoft have opted for AMD's custom APU solution that combines a CPU and GPU onto a single chip. Now this has its advantages. An APU makes it more efficient for the two chips to work in unison. This consumes less power. And the physical benefits are of course that the surface area of the single chip is much more manageable in terms of cooling. Both APUs host a custom low-power AMD Jaguar CPU that has two quad-core modules that are designed around the x86 architecture common from PCs dating back over 30 years. The PS4 hosts a 1.6 GHz processor and the Xbox One hosts a 1.75 GHz Jaguar CPU. And in case you're wondering what x86 really means, well the x86 instruction set is basically the main interface between the programming language and the hardware x86 has been the most common instruction set used by both Intel and AMD since the very beginning of modern PCs, so it should be very familiar to pretty much everyone in the business of programming games. Now, this was not the case for the PS3 cell processor, which was more than just a simple pain in the ass to develop for. The power PC solution on the Xbox 360 was better in this regard, but it was also not the most ideal solution in terms of development across multiple platforms. And thank goodness both companies have now realized the importance of making game development as convenient and as affordable as possible. I think it's very unlikely that Sony and Microsoft made a deal behind closed doors to unify the key architecture. So I'd actually give credit here to AMD, who has most likely presented both companies with an offer they could not refuse. And this is to the benefit of the entire industry. So much obliged AMD, and good thing that Nvidia wasn't a sore loser. In any case, the Xbox One's more robust cooling solution enables a slightly higher clock speed, so the green team's has a 10% advantage here. There's still debate on how many CPU cores are actually devoted to gaming performance on both systems, but most likely these differences aren't substantial enough to give significant advantages to either console as modern games are less CPU bound and more GPU intensive. And this is exactly why the majority of the chip real estate is devoted to the graphics processing unit on both APUs. The GPUs in both consoles are based on AMD's GCN, or Graphics Core Next architecture. This is essentially the same architecture as in AMD's HD7000 and its new R9 series of graphics cards. And it's actually the same architecture as used in my own 7970GHz edition graphics card. At its prime, so about two weeks ago, this was a 400 buck graphics card. So in addition to this semi-high-end GPU, my gaming rig features about a grand and a half of other components. So the PS4 can really be placed take a upright, rocket scientist but according to, to Microsoft, Microsoft, the Xbox the PCs One will always be a step ahead the choice of consoles, disk drive, because which you is can not just throw an endless amount of money into it. But don't get me wrong, performance optimization is where the consoles can really stand out against PC, where the potential of even high-end graphics cards often underused, coding directly to specific set of hardware enables developers to crunch out every little bit of juice. And this is why console games can look absolutely gorgeous, and in many cases, even get close to the visual fidelity of high-end graphics cards. Kept you waiting, huh? Beautiful graphics are just so much more than high-resolution graphics and textures, multi-sample anti-aliasing and above 60 frame rate. I'd actually go out to say that design and art makes up for about half of the visual experience, and in some cases even more. That being said, I do expect a significant leap in graphical prowess with every generation of hardware. So I'm a bit surprised at how many Why Resolution Doesn't Matter articles there are out there, because in an age where 40 inch televisions are considered as small, resolution simply matters. 720p on a 65 inch screen at an average viewing distance, things start to get fugly pretty fast. 
At these TV sizes, there is a significant difference between 720p and 1080p, and this is true whether or not you believe in it. I got a bit sidetracked there, but in any case, both GPUs embedded on the dies of the consoles are of the same AMD architecture. But there are some significant differences. Microsoft elected to implement 12 GCN cores, resulting in a total of 768 stream processors, while Sony went with a total of 18 GCN cores. And that adds up to 1152 stream processors. And this equals to 50% more stream processors on the PS4. And what are stream processors, you ask? Well, stream processors in the GPU handle most of the traditional graphics rendering tasks, but they can also be harnessed for more general purpose number crunching, and one good example of this are particle effects, which seem to be making a comeback this generation. The GCN cores are capable of doing a lot of the tasks that were traditionally assigned to the central processing unit, and they can actually do a lot better job at it. We've already seen games like Resogun and Infamous Second Son use very elaborate particle systems, and Metal Gear Ground Zeroes has a spectacular simulated weather system. This is actually done mostly by the GPU, as the architecture allows for general purpose computing which modern GPUs can actually do better than traditional CPUs. With the GPU and 8-core CPU working together, we can expect some pretty spectacular stuff to come. We'll see much more advantage taken of these features as we progress in the console's life cycles. In addition to 64 stream processors, each GCN core hosts 4 texture mapping units. As the PlayStation 4 has 50% more GCN cores, it also has the same advantage in texture mapping units which are responsible for addressing and filtering the textures that you see on the screen. The more texture mapping units you have, the faster the GPU will be at processing texture info. While the Xbox One may have the better clock rate on the GPU, the PS4 has 50% more GCN cores, which may result in a lot more leeway when it comes to graphics rendering and even some more general purpose computing tasks. But where does all this power come from? Let's take a closer look at what powers these consoles. Zoom in please. A little bit more, just a tad bit more. And what about the Xbox One? Right, in any case, ROPS or Raster Operations Pipelines are also key to visuals. ROPS help with implementing anti-aliasing that smooths out the jaggies, anistrophic filtering that enhances the textures, and Z-buffer that calculates depth effects, etc. This is essentially the part of the GPU that makes the finishing touches to the graphics. So having half the amount of ROPS isn't doing the Xbox One any favors. The PlayStation 4 has eight ACE units, or Asynchronous Compute Engines, while the Xbox One only has two. Asynchronous compute engine serve as command processors for compute operations on the GCN cores. In essence, they manage the workflow and resource allocation of the various tasks, making it more efficient for the GCN cores to do several tasks at the same time. As time goes by, developers may learn new techniques to capitalize on these ACE units, subsequently reducing the GPU's workload. On a side note, the PS4 actually shares the same amount of ACE units as the super high-end R9 290X AMD graphics card. But the power of the CPU and GPU are nothing without the memory interface, and one of the biggest complaints from developers about last-gen hardware was the memory, or simply the lack thereof. High-definition graphics require a crapload of textures and all kinds of content simultaneously on the screen for each individual frame. So you can imagine how tricky it has been to fit even 720p's worth of textures for every frame of content with less than 512 megabytes of RAM. For this generation, the message is clear from both Sony and Microsoft. You asked for it, so here it is. Developers no longer need to waste time in conceiving clever ways of streaming textures from virtual memory. They can just throw an enormous amount of textures and other attributes in huge pools of memory. So when it comes to graphics, I am pretty sure that the amount of memory will not be the bottleneck of this generation. 8 gigabytes is more than enough. Both systems have a unified memory architecture, with the same memory being allocated for graphics and various other tasks. Microsoft went with a more conservative and affordable alternative of DDR3, and Sony splurged on some more expensive but faster GDDR5. The differences between the two are that DDR3 is considered as more general purpose memory, 
and GDDR5 is mainly designed for graphics use. Both types of memory have their benefits. GDDR5 is significantly faster allowing for whopping memory bandwidth, but DDR3 has a lower latency, which allows a bit faster access. To compensate for the lower bandwidth of DDR3, the Xbox One uses 32 megabytes of a super fast ES RAM, which is embedded on the same die with the CPU and GPU for almost immediate access. The ES RAM is specifically reserved for tasks that require a very high bandwidth. Developers are also able to access both memory pools simultaneously, which can make it possible for more overlapping graphical effects. While the 32 megabytes may seem a bit small for this day and age, developers can map and unmap content on the super fast virtual memory with amazing speed and super low latency, which can enable all kinds of graphical eye candy like Z-buffer and shadow maps effects. For example, Project Cars will use the ES RAM for deferred rendering, so we can expect to see developers better taking advantage of the ES RAM going forward. Despite the undoubtedly interesting potential of ES RAM, many developers have stated to prefer the sustained speed of GDDR5 over ES RAM simply for the fact that GDDR5 is almost as fast, and there is essentially no limit to how much you can use, and it's just that much more straightforward to code for. There is a misconception, however, going about that ES RAM is bottlenecking the Xbox One from outputting 1080p. This simply is the case, because 32 megabytes of high bandwidth ES RAM is more than sufficient for a 1080p frame buffer. It's more likely that the ES RAM is indirectly limiting the performance by taking up space on the APU die from elements that actually crunch out the numbers to push out the pixels. I think many would agree that this real estate could have been better served with more GCN cores, for example. Clock speed, teraflop counts, ROPs, ACES, memory bandwidth, how does all this tech spec jargon translate into practice? Quite consistently throughout every multi-platform game released to date, there seems to be a slight pattern emerging. Xbox One iterations of games are running at lower resolutions. Metal Gear Solid Ground Zeroes, Call of Duty Ghosts, Final Fantasy XIV, Tomb Raider, Trials Fusion, and the list goes on all run at 1080p on the PS4, and not so much on the Xbox One. The tech spec advantage is on paper, and the math is adding up. To sum things up, both systems have done a good job in making things as accessible as possible for developers. 8 gigs of RAM is more than enough to enable developers to slap all the textures and all the content that is needed for 1080p renderings of graphics. The Xbox One has the GPU and CPU running at a higher clock rate, but no matter how you look at it, the amount of stream processors ultimately determine how many pixels these chips are crunching out, and the PS4 has a significant advantage in this respect. The advantage in stream processors is also consistent with the power consumption tests we made in Episode 2. PS4 is more power hungry, and this is very much thanks to the GCN cores eating up those watts, and the math is consistently adding up as well. Sony gambled with implementing the more expensive GDR5, which Microsoft stated to be not great for developers. But looking at how games perform and how much textures developers have already managed to slap into games like Infamous Second Son and even launch game Killzone Shadowfall, not to mention the praise that the PS4 has been getting from devs, it's safe to say that Sony's gamble has already paid off. I'm actually a bit surprised at how technically accomplished the games were even at the earlier stages of this product cycle. This is something that I definitely could not say during the last generation. While the Xbox One is by no means a slouch, the PS4 has a 50% advantage in stream processors, double the amount of ROPs, four times the ACE units, a faster unified memory, and added bandwidth paths from CPU direct to the GPU and memory. At this particular time and space, it's hard to argue with the hardware. And it's impossible to argue with the map. And for these reasons, the PlayStation 4 takes round 3 with a clear mark. In the next round, we'll be answering the question, what the fuck is Mario? And we'll be taking a look at Nintendo's stake in the console war. Stay tuned for the next installment of the console war.
by the way, I believe in uh, winners and losers, and, and especially the freedom to fail. Who? Who? Him? Who? Him? Who? Him? Him? him, 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 him who? Me? What? I don't know. Thank you guys for watching. Please subscribe right here. Be the first ones to know whenever new videos get uploaded. We got a ton of stuff. We do phones, tablets, cars, anything that has to do with consumer electronics that has to be plugged in or uses batteries. We review.